Need a tutorial? <laughs> Ah, good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Bellevue United Methodist Church. Whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. It is a special day in the life of the church. Today we celebrate Laity Sunday. Laity Sunday celebrates the giftedness and calling of laity in ministry. Now, if you don't know church speak, what laity means, what a lay person is, is a person who is not ordained as an elder or a deacon in the United Methodist Church is the language we use. We are very fortunate to have wonderful leaders um, who are ordained, Reverend Brian Marcoulier, our, our lead pastor, and Reverend Debbie Tyree our Minister of Music and Mission, they gift us so much um, in their leadership. But we are lay people here, most of us. We have a few retired clergy, and we are also called to minister and to ministry. And today is the day that we celebrate that. And so in honor of that, Lloyd Cahoon will be bringing our message this morning. He serves as our lay speaker, and although we are all called to lay ministry, there are some laity who take their calling to the next level and take classes to become certified lay servants. We have two of those in our congregation, Lloyd, who you will be hearing from uh, as we do the message, and my wife, Rachel Haywood, is also a certified lay servant. You'll be hearing from her at children's time this morning. So we want to give thanks for the leadership of our laity today. We have a few announcements as we get started. First, we want to remind you about the church picnic, which is next Sunday, October 23rd at 3 p.m. at Poplar Hollow Farm. There are directions on how to get there in the Welcome Center, um, in the newsletter, or you can also call the church uh, this week if you need directions on how to get there. Um, also note that you are asked to bring something. It's a potluck, um, and we've assigned different types of food based on the first letter of your last name. So check that list out so you know what to bring to share to eat. The church will provide the hot dogs and the drinks. So that's coming up. The following week, 
Uh, Monday, October 31st is Halloween. A big ministry that this church participates in every year is our trunk or treat. Um, you can decorate the back of your car, park it out here, and kids from all over our neighborhood come and trick-or-treat. They walk through, they see the decorations, they get candy, um, and they see our witness in this neighborhood. However, this event does not come off without a lot of work from our lay people. So what we need from you are two things. One, and this is something everybody can do, is to bring a bag of candy or a non-food item, a small trinket, a toy that can be given away um, to the Welcome Center. There's some baskets out here you'll see that are already filling up. Um, we do provide all the candy and giveaways for the trick-or-treaters, but we need your help to do that. So the next time you're in the grocery store, pick up an extra bag uh, of candy or treats to bring to the church. We also need some more people to sign up to decorate their cars and be out here. We have a few, um, but we need a few more. So there's a sign-up sheet in the Welcome Center. You can also talk to Melinda Williams if you're interested in signing up to do that. That's a big ministry. Um, also out in the Welcome Center, it's the last Sunday for our pecan sale. Um, please go and order your pecans for all your holiday baking. Um, the United Women in Faith are doing this fundraiser for the Redbird uh, Missionary Conference uh, in Kentucky. So please order your pecans today. Speaking of the United Women in Faith, we also want to thank them for putting a rose on the altar this morning, um, which is in honor of the birth of Rowan Elizabeth Scalone. Uh, so we celebrate with the Scalone family. Finally, I want to let you know that October is Clergy Appreciation Month. So we, as I mentioned earlier, have some wonderful clergy. If you would this week, take a moment, write a card to Brian or Debbie, send them an email, send them a text. Let them know that you are thankful for their leadership. Um, it has been a challenging few years with the pandemic and they have led with um, grace and strong leadership um, and we need to express our thanks to them. So please take a moment to do that. So now as Lloyd lights our candle, let us take a deep breath and prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
morning. Morning. Your response to the call to worship is come and worship. People of God, hear the call. Come, come and, and worship. worship. Even if you're tired and worn out, come, come and, and worship. worship. Lay down the heavy things you are carrying. Come, come and, and worship. worship. Listen to what Jesus wants to tell you. Come, come and, and worship. worship. See if you can discover how Jesus wants to use you. Come, come and, and worship. worship. For Jesus is humble and gentle, and he will give us everything we need to follow him. Our opening hymn of praise this morning is Praise the Source of Faith and Learning. It can be found in the Faith We Sing, number 2004, right at the beginning. Let us rise in body or spirit as we are able to sing together. <coughs> seated. Our scripture reading for today is from Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapters 3, verse 14 through 4, verse 5. But you must continue with the things you have learned and found convincing. You know who taught you. Since childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures 
that help you to be wise in a way that leads to salvation through faith, faith that is in Christ Jesus. Every scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing mistakes, for correcting, and for training character, so that the person who belongs to God can be equipped to do everything that is good. I'm giving you this commission in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is coming to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready to do it, whether it be convenient or inconvenient. Correct, confront, encourage with patience and instruction. There will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. They will call teachers who say what they want to hear because they are self-centered. They will turn their back on the truth and turn to myths. But you must keep control of yourself in all circumstances. Endure suffering, do the work of the preacher of the good news, and carry out your service fully. This is the word of the Lord. I invite the children to come forward for the children's time. So if you were here a little bit ago, some of you were, we sang a whole bunch of songs just a little while ago during our Sunday school hour this morning. And we're going to sing some more songs during church today. Um, and one of the songs that we're going to sing next is called I Am the Church. How many of you have heard that song before? Do you know that song? No? It's new? Oh, I'm so good because my whole children's sermon is to teach you this song. And if you already knew it, then I didn't know what we were going to do. <laughs> So um, one of the reasons we're going to sing this song this morning is because our whole service today is talking about how we, the people in the church, are really what make up the church. So sometimes when we think about church, we think about our pastors, like Pastor Brian and Pastor Debbie, or we think about our Sunday school teachers, we think about the leaders, we think about the sanctuary, we might think about the cross and the altar or the banners that hang. We think about our playground and the fun times that we have out there. And so we think about the people who are maybe in charge, but we also think about the place. But it's really important to remember that all of those make up the church, but also what makes up the church is us. We, each of you, are part of the church. And that's what this song helps us remember. So I want you to sing after me. We're going to learn this phrase by phrase. And then when we sing the hymn in a minute, you guys will be ready and prepared to sing along, okay? So I'll sing a phrase, and then you sing after me, okay? I am the church. I am the church. You are the church. You are the church, we are the church together, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus, all who follow Jesus, all around the world, all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Yes, we're the church together. Great job. Let's sing the whole thing all together. You think you can do it? We'll give it a try, okay? If you want to look at the words, if you're a reader, you can look right here. And it's these words right here in our, in our bulletin, okay? Ready? I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Excellent singing! In just a few minutes, we're going to sing that hymn together, and you guys will be well prepared to sing along, okay? Think you can do it? I know you can. Let's say a prayer and thank God for our church. Dear God, thank you for all of us 
who work together to make up your body, the church. The work that we do in the world and the ways that we show your love to everyone. Amen. I'm so glad that you all sing with the children because now you're warmed up and you know the song too. You, are, you may remain seated, but let's sing the first two stanzas of We Are the Church. It's number 558 if you'd like to follow along in the hymnal. church together. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is the people. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church too. We're many kinds of people with many kinds of faces, all colors and all ages, too, from all times and places. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Please join me in prayer. Our Father, we are confronted, comforted by your presence, whether we're here in the sanctuary at Bellevue United Methodist Church or participating from home. Today, let us embrace this Laity Sunday as a day when we take the challenge offered by your servant Paul to his assistant Timothy. As aspiring disciples of your son, Jesus Christ, let us go beyond just being the church members and to take the challenge to faithfully participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Amen. I felt really good about giving this message. But then this morning, one of our Judd Wesley class members, of which I'm a teacher, came in. I won't mention her name, but she was carrying a pillow. <laughs> now, I'm not sure what that means, but... I'm going to keep an eye on her during the service, so if you see me looking that way, you'll know. <laughs> so today is Lady Sunday in the church. Normally, when we have a special day designated in our church, it's a cause for celebration. Think Easter and Christmas. And that's true of Lady Sunday as well. But I would be remiss if I didn't also mention that Lady Sunday should be a day of rededication, a rededication of our lives to the church and to our Savior Jesus. The title of my homily is Be Prepared and Act, and hopefully it mirrors what Paul had to say to Timothy in his letter. But first of all, if you don't mean, know me, my name is Lloyd Cahoon. I've been a member of the church for 14 years, and I like to think that I've served faithfully in many of its ministries, except the choir, from which I've been barred. <laughs> I'm a certified lay servant as a as, uh, Mark mentioned, of the United Methodist Church, serving alongside my cohort, Rachel. And by the way, I encourage any of you who would like to explore your faith more and find new ways to engage in the way of the church to go through the training to become a certified lay servant. I think you will find it rewarding. Our scripture lesson today is from a letter traditionally thought to be written by the Apostle Paul to his young co-worker, Timothy, who is serving a new church in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus is under pressure from the Roman government, and there are all sorts of preachers out there spreading mistruths about Jesus' life and message. Paul is in prison. He's facing death. The bulk of this letter, which we call 2 Timothy, has as its underlying theme the importance of God's work and of godly living. Paul encourages Timothy, who is naturally timid and facing his own persecution, 
to find in Scripture all he needs to persevere. According to Paul, God's word is the only foundation strong enough to stand upon in perilous times. Now, many current scholars believe that Paul did not write the epistle. Instead, they think it was written by one of Paul's close associates. That, however, doesn't change the message. And although the message is thought to be a pastoral letter, that is, pastor to pastor, it is just as important to us as lay people as we conduct ourselves in the real world. After all, we as a congregation pledge to care for each other and to walk along with children and adults as they were baptized or committed to our church. In short, we pledge to preach God's word to this community and world through our actions. My comments this morning are going to be divided into two categories. One is going to, and they're going to mirror chapter three that I read earlier. Uh, the first I'll call be prepared, and the second will be to take action. And again, I'll repeat the first part of my uh, scripture reading. But you must continue with the things you have learned and found convincing. You know who taught you. Since childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. I'm a lifelong Methodist, and even before the merger of denominations led to our current United Methodist Church, I think back to my childhood and youth, and I'm reminded of part of our scripture reading for today. Since childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures that help you to be wise in a way that leads to salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. My early years did expose me to the church and biblical teaching. Quite literally, I was in awe when I stepped into the sanctuary of our relatively small church. Then I went off to college, began a working career in finance at General Electric Company, eventually became the chief financial officer of GE's mortgage banking business and Southwest region manager of GE Finance. Um, and I kind of fell away from the church. I didn't renounce it, but I didn't emphasize it in my life as I did as a youngster. Yet as I progressed through my career, something kept nagging at me. I was exposed to all sorts of temptations. Greed, lust, pride, insider trading, alcohol, drugs. This is the time of the leverage buyout craze and the movie Wall Street did not overemphasize it. Um, you get the picture, I hope. I saw many of my counterparts fall victim to these threats. Now, I wasn't perfect, but for the most part, I stayed out of trouble. Why? I'm not entirely sure, but I think it has to do with the formation of my conscience in those early years. In my mind, my conscience had been educated in those early years as to what a follower of Christ should be. I think that this is what Paul was saying in his letter to Timothy when he said that since childhood, you have known the Holy Scripture that help you to be wise in a way that leads to salvation and through faith that is in Jesus. There is no doubt in my mind that the early teachings and examples offered by my elders led to the formation of a conscience that helped me ward off destructive temptations, at least for the most part. And to you parents and members of the congregation, this is the greatest gift we can give to our collective children. Now, fast forward to 2008. My wife and I have moved to Nashville I'm trying to convert from being a Patriots fan to a Titans fan. <laughs> Not going well, by the way. Uh, somewhat unsuccessfully, I might add. I tried a few churches in the area, and on my third try, wandered into the sanctuary. Fully thereafter, shortly thereafter, I had my United Methodist membership transferred, and I joined this church. I became a member. The second part of my Carmen deal with take action. Paul says there will, there will come a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. They will collect teachers who say what they want to hear because they are self-centered. They will turn their back on the truth and turn to myths. But you must keep control of yourself in all circumstances. Now, Paul writes his letter to Timothy during a time there are all sorts of preachers out there preaching all sorts of other dogma regarding God and other gods with a small g. Timothy is facing persecution himself and needs reassurance. But you ask, is it true now? Do we have these outside influences? Surely there aren't competing forces trying to capture our attention. No one is turning their backs on truth and relying on myths, are they? 
Now, if you don't believe that we're in a time when other room influences are tempting us, consider this. There are about 2.4 million Christians in the world. 2.4 million people follow Jesus. 210 million of those are here in the U.S. Kim Kardashian has 300 million followers on Instagram. 300 million. Last week, Aaron Judge of the New York Yankees <clears throat> hit his 60-second home run of the season, breaking Roger Maris' 61-year record. The fan that caught the ball in the off-field stands has been offered $2 million for that ball. Now, these are minor symptoms of problems that exist in today's world. But consider these additional things. Are you aware that a couple of the Proud Boy groups that were involved in the insurrection on the U.S. Capitol on January 6th <clears throat> actually did their planning at lunch after church? Isn't that unbelievable? Russia's war in Ukraine with the Eastern Orthodox Church apparently lending a blind eye? Have you noticed that we are well beyond the time of simply disagreeing on many issues of the day? Now we are bombarded with a hatred associated with people of disagreeing opinions regarding all sorts of issues. We are fed on truths. It's amazing to me that as often Christians, followers of Jesus, who are at the heart of preaching hateful words regarding women's reproductive rights, sexual orientation, gun control, racial equity, racial disparities of health care and education, right and access. Make no mistake, my issue is not with differing opinions, but rather of the hatefulness expressed against the people who have uh, expressed those different opinions and of the untruth of reporting. As Christians, we should be solving these problems, not exacerbating them. And by the way, consider the words of our beloved Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven. Sometimes we forget the Our Father, everybody's. <clears throat> Maybe today's reading from the epistle from Paul to Timothy can give us some guidance. So where is the love for all that Jesus preached? So back to my story. I became active, taught the Judd Russell Sunday School class, served as a trustee, ushered, chair of the church council, and other activities. Things were going well. Then about five years ago, Pastor Brian formed a long-range planning team to consider where we should go as a church. I had the privilege of participating uh, in this work for about two years. It soon became apparent to me that although I was active in the church, I was missing the point to some extent. Ultimately, we adopted the current mission statement for our church, growing disciples of Jesus Christ through relationships for the transformation of the community and world. A constant deliberation in our work over those two years was the need to grow disciples of Jesus Christ. It was in this process that I finally learned then being the member of the church wasn't the end all. What Jesus wants us to be is disciples. Over time, I realized that being a disciple not only required doing something for and in the church, but also intentionally considering what it was that I was doing. My mindset changed from the attitude of scripture as a basis for good behavior that I learned as a youngster to an attitude, an attitude that I should live my life as Jesus would want, us, want me to. Paul asks well, that we do what is right, and to me that means being a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Here's where the rubber meets the road. Are we just church members, or are we true disciples with all that distinction entails? And to be true disciples, we have to take actions, not just be members of a church. If we think we live in a community, country, and world marked by distrust, hatred, and anger, it's up to us to try to change that by our action. Maybe one conversation at a time. Again, Paul's words to Timothy are getting to the point. The intention of Jesus' teaching is not for us to be good, but to act like Jesus. Now we know that's not truly possible, but when we love God and we love each other, we tend to care more for each other and to try to help those most in needs. I applaud those of you who attended Rachel Haywood's adult faith formation class over the past few weeks. And I commend this con congregation, which has acted as Jesus' disciples for years, 
through vehicles like the Food Bank, Room at the Inn, Redbird Mission, and many others. But now we're also providing space for the Mobile Housing Navigation Center, a wonderful program to assist persons uh, without homes in the process of trying to find permanent housing and assisting the Bellevue Middle School with some of their educational mission, missions. Events that seem like fun, like VBS and Trunk or Treat, are a method of preaching the good news of Jesus Christ just as well. So I challenge each of us to faithfully consider what it means to be a true disciple and to participate in the ministries of a church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. In short, show the world that there's a better way. No hatred of people just because they disagree with us. No putting people down just because they don't have the same advantages we may have had. Let's follow Paul's advice to Timothy and do the work of a preacher of the good news and carry out your service fully. Amen. Our response to the word is the third and fourth stanzas of We Are the Church. You may remain seated as we sing together. <clears throat> As we come to our time of prayer this morning, I invite you to look in your bulletin and your newsletter to remember those in our congregation and community who are especially in need of prayer. Of course, we will continue to remember uh, Reverend Debbie Tyree um, uh, as, as she uh, is in the hospital and, and still waiting for clear answers and a clear path forward. We pray for healing and strength for her. We pray for uh, Wayne Plump as he recovers. Um, we pray for the people who are still recovering from Hurricane Ian and other natural disasters in our world. And others, of course, we want to remember uh, Jim Edwards as he continues to grieve the loss of his wife, Ruby. And we remember um, Sarah as well and the Timken family as they remember Sarah's mother. And there are others, I'm sure, in your heart and in your mind today, and we bring those to God this morning. Let us pray together. Holy God, with the precious jewel of Holy Scripture, you share with us the treasure of your heart. Engrave your covenant, your hopes, your dreams, your vision, your peace upon our hearts that they might beat as one with yours. Holy word, ever clear, you keep us from wandering down the wrong paths. Ever longed for, you make us persistent in bringing justice to the lost and to the least. Ever practical, you show us how not to misplace our hearts. Holy wisdom, as you breathe the word into our hearts, tutor us in faithfulness. So we are trained in using the tools of justice and hope. So we are equipped to share the good news with all. So we become skilled in compassion and grace. God in community, holy in one, we lift our hearts to you as we pray, as Jesus teaches us, saying, 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to this portion of our service where we prepare to give our tithes and offerings to God. As Lloyd mentioned in his sermons, we are not just members of the church. We are disciples of Jesus. And part of our mission at Bellevue is growing as disciples of Jesus. This week, you will be receiving in the mail an estimate of giving card for 2023. Our theme for our stewardship campaign this year is growing our faith through giving. This is one of those ways where we can grow as disciples, which is why we're here. You will be invited to pray and reflect on the ways that you will commit financially to the mission and ministry of Bellevue United Methodist Church in 2023. Now, I could talk to you about why we need you to give. I could talk about the rising electricity bill, which I'm sure you're facing at your house as well. I could talk to you about the HVAC units that need repair. I could talk to you about the wonderful staff we have um, that we need to pay uh, for the work that they do. I could talk to you about the ministries that your gifts support, whether it's curriculum for Vacation Bible School or an anthem uh, for the choir, or supplies for our upcoming trunk or treat and church picnic. And all of those things are important. But the primary reason I'm asking you to consider your giving for next year is not because we need it, although we do. I'm asking you to consider your giving because we are disciples of Jesus. And one way that we grow as disciples is through our giving, through our faithful giving. So I hope you will join me in making that commitment and letting us know your pledge for 2023. The offertory this morning was planned to be a quartet with the Johnson and Becker families. Unfortunately, sickness has hit the Becker uh, family this week, so we want to remember, especially Melissa uh, and Danny, as they recover. We will have them another Sunday to sing. Um, so the offertory, the act of praise this morning um, will be Rachel Haywood uh, singing Take My Life. Take 
God, as we offer our gifts to you today, we pray that in our giving we may be reconnected to the reason why we follow you and the reason why we give to you. You called us to be disciples, to make disciples, who make disciples, to know who we are and who you are and why we're following you. Help us avoid that which distracts us. Help us to shun the things which make the road easier because they won't bring us the kingdom of justice, mercy, and compassion that you desire for us. In Christ, our guiding light, we pray. Amen. Amen. I found the mission in the call to offering that uh, if you have an offering, there's an offering plate just outside this door in the Welcome Center. You can leave that uh, on your way out. Also, if you will leave your attendance card to let us know you were here this morning, we appreciate that as well. And as you leave, don't forget, we have pecan orders. We have trunk or treat sign up in the Welcome Center as well. Our sending forth hymn is number 463, Lord Speak to Me. Please remain standing as we sing together.
My good friend, Reverend Gary Cornell, always closes service with the words, a benediction is not a prayer, but rather a sending off blessing. So accordingly, let's go into the community and world bearing the light of Christ so that all may know that we are people of God by our demeanor and by our actions so we can help transform the world and the community. Amen. 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 Go. Oh.